Meritocracy in Singapore must not falsify into a hereditary system where the condition of your birth determines, determines the, the outcome of, of, your of, life. of your life. Meritocracy could entrench uh, privilege and inequality because there would be people who within the system succeed on merit, but in turn they're able to pass on some of the advantages to the children. We can move very quickly to a kind of a caste system Meritocracy doesn't just produce structural disadvantage, but it purports to justify that disadvantage. That leads to forms of resentment, it leads to populism, produces uprisings against the elite order. There are many people taking to the streets because they believe that they have been the losers of a system. We can see growing public concern about some of the shortcomings. So we must have the courage to reset it is probably the most critical issue of our age. Measuring Meritocracy, take one. The first time I encountered the word meritocracy was teachers saying I must do well and life can go far. We are made to chase that paper, we are made to chase that result. Students who do well go on to do better schools, jobs of higher status or better paying jobs. Meritocracy seems to be something that is good. But then again, as I grew up, I kind of question the outcomes of the system. Well, a meritocracy is a society or a system where advancement and economic rewards according to talent, uh, achievement or effort rather than one's family background, connections or you know, social class. The meritocracies that have swept the world in the last 100 or 200 years have been market meritocracies. And those are meritocracies in which what counts as an accomplishment tends to be doing really well at school and then taking your skills and talents to the labor market to work. Well, the intent of meritocracy is to actually allow for everybody to progress, certainly in Singapore, regardless of race, language or religion. So it was a concept that would definitely integrate because it guarantees the equality of opportunities. Meritocracies were everywhere embraced to break aristocracies that had increasingly been viewed as unfair, incompetent, frozen, sclerotic. In Imperial China, the exam system was first created in the Sui Dynasty, largely because the emperor really wanted a separate power base from the aristocracy. He wanted to be able to select uh, capable people to work for him and his government, who are not just from the usual aristocratic families. And the elite that you build is the most capable because it's drawn from the largest pool of contenders. This is what happened in England in the 19th century when English meritocracy came to allow people to advance through, in particular, the British East India Company at the time. When we go back in Britain to the reforms of the 1860s in Queen Victoria's time, when we introduced exams for senior jobs in the civil service, previously these jobs had often been arranged through nepotism. People had literally bought the job or they were given the job because one of their relatives had a high position in the organisation. Now that obviously is not a, a sensible system in a, particularly in a modern democracy. So, you know, we needed exams. We needed mass higher education to challenge the old nepotistic elite. Now, some of these ideas also carry over into colonial office and the whole idea of how empire is being governed. Perhaps in the Singapore context, we could think about the introduction of scholarships. The Queen's scholarship is one way, and this occurs around the 1880s, 
that we begin to see a standardized exam used to select what were considered the best and brightest, those with the most potential within Singapore and the Strait Settlements, for them to have the opportunity to go and pursue further studies in the UK. Just as in Imperial China, you now have a prize that families can, can target. You can imagine that if a really lucrative scholarship is being offered and that this scholarship essentially translates into mobility and to uh, an elevated status when you return, that many local families would start saying, hey, let's not overlook the young uh, Chinese, for instance. Within the first couple of years of the scholarships being awarded, some of those names appear uh, Western, but then very rapidly, you begin to see more and more Chinese names in particular appearing. We are Asians and a majority of the people living in Singapore are of Chinese descent. Chinese Confucian ideas are in society and they do make a difference to the way we react, for instance, uh, to our meritocracy. The colonial government was giving out these scholarships obviously in order to build up a generation of uh, local born people who are going to be loyal to them, to the empire. They weren't too concerned when it comes to offering education to all. State-funded mass education is really an industrial age uh, phenomenon. Uh, prior to that, it's really not within the capability of typical states to be able to provide mass education for a big part of the population. It was a very uneven policy if we think about colonial Singapore that some English language schools or English medium schools were given funding. There were mission schools that were quite important in providing a level of education. But there were other schools which were classified as vernacular schools, which were operating in various languages. So Chinese is one example. These were quite often left to the communities to fund. And it's only really when you're approaching that period of self-governance, the 1950s, you begin to have a much clearer articulation of what it means to have an educated populace and to create a minimum standard of education. In education, the policy of the government is to aim at equal treatment for all schools and all teachers in those schools. The foundation stone of the policy will be a six-year course of free primary education for all children. If you have mass education, you have an educated workforce. They are also thinking in terms of uplifting the masses. And of course, on top of this, you also have the desire to, of the civil service to select the best and the brightest. If we look back in history, in uh, 1955, the Labour Front government introduced free education for all. And this effort um, really stepped up following the PAP government as well in 1959 in terms of improving the access and quality of education. The first half of the 1960s saw a massive school building program and efforts to enroll as many children as possible, especially at the primary level. And by 1966, universal provision of primary education had been achieved. So a generation of less well-off Singaporeans really benefited from this free education and were able to you know, move up in their careers and in life. In my days, it was even before uh, Singapore became independent in 1965. Obviously, and there are a lot poorer people, uh, a lot more people with humble backgrounds than you find today. Many a times I go to school, I have no money to buy food, but I cannot, I cannot show my empty box to my friend, not very nice. My father was a taxi driver, my mother was a teacher. I grew up knowing I would not be able to go to university if it were not for a scholarship. Being the first taxi driver's son who got a president's scholarship, it's beyond anything anybody had dared to think about. I'm a beneficiary from a system uh, which um, chooses people according to their capacity rather than financial resources. The system gives us the opportunity, although just based on studies, get out of poverty and, and get a better job. Education uh, was seen and today still is, in many ways, the most important leveler that everyone should be given the opportunity to develop their talents and abilities the best way possible. In Singapore, the meritocratic system may be very fair, 
when everybody in 1965 and those early years were equally poor. But after the first round, and certainly after the second round, of a meritocratic system where people are sorted based on their grades, their academic achievement, those who have done well in the first and second round will be in positions of advantage and will have lots of resources to ensure that their children do better. And so the trap is, first of all, that while meritocracy was invented as the engine of opportunity and equality of opportunity, it becomes a block to equality of opportunity. Singapore is a meritocracy, and these men have risen to the top by their own merit. Meritocracy cannot be left to its own devices. This is fundamental to maintaining Singapore as an open meritocracy. We cannot abandon meritocracy, but I believe we can improve it. Meritocracy is one of the key pillars of Singapore's governing philosophy and it has been so for probably about 60 years or so. And we can see growing public concern about some of the shortcomings. It has worked well for many years, but there are dangers that could keep people in social stratification. And so it's something that we need to continually uh, work at and to seek people's buy-in on how to reform the meritocracy to keep it relevant and to keep it fair for Singaporeans. It's a natural tendency that you want to do the best for your child. It's imbibed in our mother's milk, particularly for Asians. Over time, those who have made good in the meritocratic system in the early years are able to give their children a better starting point than those who haven't. And this is, of course, very worrying for all of us because it threatens the ideals of meritocracy in Singapore. The method of transmission of privilege down through the generations of a family is no longer breeding and titles. Instead, it's training. It's just that the rich out-train everybody else. They pay much more for schools. They hire tutors. And when that generation competes meritocratically for places at universities, lo and behold, the richest kids who had the most expensive educations do the best. And then they get the best jobs, and the cycle continues through each generation. I came from a lower income family group. And I believe this group mostly spend a lot of their time not in school or not at school work. But wealthier family, beyond money, these students have more time, better subjective well-being, strong network affluence. They give them a better head start compared to the rest. It is also about the influences around them. Even what they talk about drives a certain kind of mindset and mentality there is a very strong consensus that family background does have an influence on uh, types of goals and the types of aspirations and where students eventually end up in. Students coming from poorer families are more than four times more likely to be low performers compared with more affluent peers. Young children of university-educated parents hear millions more words spoken at them before they reach the age of two or three than young children of parents with less money in education. That influences language acquisition, it influences certain kinds of skills acquisition in preschool, and then preschool starts. As soon as any kind of schooling gets going, the elite again dramatically outcompetes the rest of society. There's growing research evidence from around the world that high-quality preschool education is very vital in terms of nurturing a child's learning potential. And that's why many parents spend a great deal of money in pursuit of what they perceive to be high-quality preschool education. Alicia, my daughter, is excelling within the preschool environment. The curriculum, obviously, they focus on a lot of uh, academics, but at the same time, it branches out to um, other areas of development. Our fees are around 2,000 per month, yeah? and um, that includes all of our specialist enrichment programs. 
and music is the conduit that connects all these key parts of literacy. I do believe preschool is important because it helps them to be prepared for you know, further education down the road, for example, primary school. Preschool helps them you know, with social skills, with how to hold themselves up, and then you're interacting with other people and being in an environment where you know, they're supposed to know how to sit still and learn, and so on and so forth. For many decades, preschool education was left almost entirely in the hands of private for-profit or not-for-profit operators. There's a great deal of diversity in terms of affordability, teaching methodologies, class size. And this started to change about a decade ago when the Early Childhood Development Agency was established. And what's happened since then is government efforts to improve the accessibility, the affordability and the quality of preschool education. We support families from diverse backgrounds. And among this group of parents that we support, there are some that will have financial needs because they come from low-income backgrounds. My first daughter, necessary in different schools. The fee is quite expensive, so I even cannot afford to pay. That's so why after I came here, they said they would try to help me for, for the financial help and parents will need different support at different stage. So what we have is a group of child-enabling executives who work closely with the families to see the kind of support that they need. For the third pillar, we have the learning support. We look at areas such as language learning as well as numeracy. What about this? Seven. Is it the same? Okay, Ali, which one is number two? I hope that when, when they grow up, uh, they not do be like me. La, because I, well, last time I in school, I don't listen to teacher. That's why right now I'm not good in English or some words that I don't know. So I want my kids to depending on his own, that he can grow up in the future, that they can work as what they want. If they can study hard also in the future, also, I hope probably I will be happy too. We do have children from less privileged families who may only join or only start their formal education only at primary one. I didn't attend kindergarten, actually. I attended primary one straight, right? Fresh uh, from childhood of happiness <laughs> into a microcosm where uh, you have to follow a certain order, a certain system. I was lost. When the results came on, uh, mid-year exams, primary one, I was number 38 out of 42. So that shocked my parents. <laughs> that was my first shock facing meritocracy. Why not make preschool education compulsory as well? Because recognising that already at primary one, some people already have a starting line which is further ahead than others because of their family's um, affluence, you know, social network, uh, ability to provide uh, enrichment classes even when they are young, from two years old or even one year old. The arms race intensifies when it comes to gaining admission to primary school. We've heard of parents who, for example, move to particular parts of Singapore in order to be preferentially considered. Students can secure spots in schools within a one kilometer distance rule. So if they live close to a school, they would have priority for entry. At the same time, we know that many of the um, popular or brand name primary schools are also found in private residential areas where property values are high. So this could uh, inadvertently give a further leg up to the more well-off in terms of gaining admission to these schools. Historically, uh, many of what we understand our elite schools are sort of based along a certain strip, Bukatima Road. If you look at the advertisements for, for um, houses for sale, invariably they mention the names of elite schools within that vicinity. So this itself is a reflection of, let's say, socioeconomic status, which the school has, over a period of time, come to, um, come to represent. So for Evan, uh, or the boys, they are in ACS Junior, through staying within 1KM. And Katie is in Singapore Chinese Girls School, SCGS. For Katie, because everyone says Dragon Year, right, a little bit harder, 
So I actually volunteered myself with the community. There are also parents who have signed up as alumni association members or as school volunteers in order to gain strategic advantage for their children. If we examine most of the admission criteria, they have nothing to do at all with the individual child's merit, as it were, but instead have everything to do with the child's family background. Some, of course, believe that uh, going to a good school, you have good network, you have better teachers, you have better programs. They're also chasing after the prospect that if they are not already alumni, their kids can be alumni and therefore be part of a special club. Then I realised, actually, if you go into these good schools here in Singapore, it's not just about the environment, but also the connections you make in those schools. You probably are studying with a minister's son or the CEO of a business you know, daughter in that same school as well. Long and short of it is that social networks do matter uh, for good jobs, progress in one's career. There's been growing public concern of whether there is sufficient social interaction among students from varying socioeconomic backgrounds within our schools. I went to a Raffles Institution, then Raffles Junior College. Yeah, I guess we didn't really look at each other's social economic backgrounds as friends, but I did know that a number of my friends did stay in private housing. An elite school had positive connotations at one point in time, but I feel that over the years, people start viewing the word elite as akin to elitism. Arrogance, you know, a little bit more haughty. Not everybody who goes to rebel Institution will be standing like that. No! This is a misinterpretation. I mean, what would Raffles say if you come back alive? Eh? What are you doing to my name? Just go to the school, don't use in my name to say that you're elite, right? I think there has been some confusion between education and sort of social networking and elitism in a sense, in the sense that schools are places of teaching and that's what we should be focused on. Perhaps um, we should better look at what alternatives there are for us to better build our network without fixating on schools being the only way to get my children into a, you know, an, a network, elite network. Horrible word. <laughs> Meritocratic elites, for all sorts of reasons, um, have a tendency to reproduce themselves. They have access to networks and mentoring and often themselves follow their parents' footsteps into the top universities and so on and so forth. I think you are finding in Singapore that this process is now beginning to set in. From the outside, Britain is often seen as a not very meritocratic country, partly because we have private schools which have an outsized influence on the elite. We need to democratise the elite and exam systems were one way of doing that. In terms of our meritocracy, it is a formula of IQ plus effort equals success, which is why our schooling system, the parents, everyone is really hell-bent on maximizing grades. Parents and society are already bringing pressures to bear on the tiny minds to excel. The foundation being laid must be good because in a few years they will be graded and slotted according to their abilities. When I was in primary school, we were streamed according to our results and I managed to get to the A class and it was really competitive because you see students who had tuition for almost every subject. Um, you see students who are competing with you the moment they see that you are ahead a little bit, you know, they will like look at your table and, and they will try to compete with you. And I didn't quite like it. I was just learning because I need to get good grades. Streaming first began at the end of 1979. It came about as a government-commissioned report identified several major shortcomings in Singapore's education system, which included high failure and dropout rates. And the report recommended, therefore, that streaming be introduced to provide students with different learning abilities a more differentiated pace and also different terminal examinations. In Singapore, the primary school leaving examination is a key sorting mechanism determining access to diverse secondary school pathways. The PSLD is the first 
high stakes national exams. I would say that it's understandable why parents are a little bit uptight and worried about the PSLE because it really sets the path that a child can take in his or her life later on. Evan, who is uh, 12 this year and he's in his PSL year. With Evan, he needs help in every way. So we have, of course, tuitions to help him along for every subject. I need to go through his corrections and I need to make sure that he understands. His daily routine is school, home, training, tuition sometimes, and then at night we will spend a little bit of time doing some self-work, especially the months leading up to PSLE. The Ministry of Education has, for over two decades now, been actively encouraging greater parental involvement in their children's education. What are the good phrases that you can use? This has contributed to the growing unevenness of the playing field for children out there. When my um, elder son entered primary one, you know, the education system has evolved so fast. Wow, got a shock. Wow. Not, not as easy as what we thought. Yeah. As well as the peer pressure, lah, the students' competitiveness. So I decided to start to sign up in terms of enrichment classes or tuitions to aid them. So for my second son, Brennan, which is primary six this year, so actually I bring him across all subject tuitions, English, Chinese, math and science. So by having all the four subjects tuition, lah, they are still an average student. So I was thinking, what if I pull out the tuition? Will they fail? There should be equal opportunities for all and that the current system of meritocracy really benefits those who can afford to more tuition, more classes, more, and you know, just more of everything. And that really disadvantages those who can't afford to pay for it. Parents who may find it difficult to be able to engage a tutor or put their children to the tuition, they hope that there could be other means. You know, that's where the schools can come in, through remedial lessons, through enrichment classes in school. Another way in which we can help support children from less privileged families is through our self-help groups. They're already providing tuition classes, enrichment classes that can help them prepare for the examinations or for the PSLE in particular. The PSLE now, instead of having that A star, A, B, C grade, we have the different achievement levels. If you get your four subjects at AL2, AL3, AL4, and AL5, then you add up two, three, four, and five, and that gives you your overall points. Because we are looking at a specific school, we also want to be, uh, to be assured that he actually gets within the grades, which is um, in AL13. But I told Evan that we should aim for an 11 to 12 because then you are guaranteed a place there. 98.4% of primary six students who sat for Singapore's primary school leaving examinations this year can go on to secondary school. My friend was like, oh, you should prank your mother. And I was like, yeah, I agree. So after that, he gave me a result slip. And then I was like, mommy, I got AL 16. But then actually, I was like, just kidding. And then I took out the slip and then I showed her I got AL 11. And then she was like, oh my gosh. And then she shouted so loudly. <laughs> so I think that was, that was uh, a memorable moment. We are really glad. Lah. We worked really hard. And um, yeah, I guess you read what you saw. Brennan, we finished our PSLE already. Yes, finally. Yes. It was like so nerve-wracking. Yeah, man. So how, how, how do you like about your result? I was super happy when I saw my results. Yeah, as well as me, I think he has tried his very best and he did his very best and this is actually what he wants. We must really celebrate in life, you know, celebrate success. There is that danger, that academic sorting for a meritocratic system is more a reflection of parental resources than uh, the student's uh, ability and effort if that sorting is done all too early. Both my parents uh, would, were not really involved uh, in my education uh, or any involvement generally in my, uh, in my schoolwork. Um, my mom has two jobs. Uh, my father was generally not around. I did not prepare much uh, for my pre-SLE from what I remember. I did very badly and I went to normal technical stream and I think my aggregate was about 100 points. When I first got the idea about streaming, I just know that, um, you know, that the smarter one will go to a better class. 
the not so smart one will go to a class that is full of people with troubled uh, situation. One of the key problems associated with streaming at both primary and secondary levels was that these sorts of biases and stereotypes began to take root in the popular consciousness. You know, some of my good friends, they were in normal stream, and then I went to express, and then they begin to, uh, okay, we're not going to mix around with you because you're express, you're the smart kid. You know, it creates this wall. During my time as a teacher, I did notice that, you know, the stream actually does affect the students. I have had students tell me that in certain classes, they feel like they're treated in an inferior manner. Some of them actually sometimes even decide to just go with the stigma and that affects their performance as well. So after a level I actually went to ITE, I honestly felt a bit discouraged every time I wear the uniform to school um, because I do have parents uh, when they are with their kids pointing at us, again saying things like, if you don't study well, this is what you're going to become because they knew that clothes was from ITE. And that's something pretty sad to, you know, go through, yeah. I couldn't understand the fact that if you are in the technical stream, you are considered the students who are weaker back in the day. And because I really love technical, my dad was a carpenter and I spent my weekends at his workshop uh, learning uh, carpentry. But because of, of the system, because of peer pressure and everything, I was kind of pushed to go into the science stream. The Ministry of Education began in the 2000s to reduce some of the adverse effects engendered by streaming. From 2024, with full subject-based banding in secondary schools, students will have greater flexibility to study more subjects at different levels that suit their interests, aptitude and learning needs. There will no longer be separate express, normal academic and normal technical courses and students will be in mixed form classes where they can interact with peers of different strengths and interests. I think that's a good step to making sure that our students uh, in most of our mainstream schools are not pigeonholed. I was really good at accounting. So maybe I could take like the best subject band class for that. And then when it comes to mathematics or maybe even science, I can go to like the weaker subject based banding classes for that as well. And in that class, I might meet someone who's really good in English or really good in mother tongue. So yeah, as compared to a one size fits all for everyone, right? Yeah. By recognising students' proficiencies across different subjects, they are more likely to develop interest, curiosity and learn outside the classroom. The motivation behind the subject-based banding program is that we want students to intermingle more. We want students to learn from each other the different types of experiences in working together. I think at least the initial result seems to be quite promising. So having this new policy, I guess uh, it will greatly uh, increase the cohesiveness within the society. Then there will be more, more empathy, more understanding, more tolerance, more inclusion and more diversity. I feel the problem may not be so much in the streaming system itself, but that we only seem to value one kind of intelligence, which is IQ. And we completely ignore emotional intelligence. There's certain people who will have other different forms of intelligence, other different contributions that also should be validated. We have seen official efforts to try and broaden the definition of merit. We have a system called the direct school admission, which can draw students because they have a special ability in hockey or dance. So Evan has got a DSA offer to ACSI uh, through squash. So that's the sports that he loves and I gave Evan lessons in squash because we thought that that would probably be a good sport for him to help him focus. It was really more leisure than anything and he worked really hard and he finally got into the national junior training team. Again, we want to examine if uh, that uh, special ability is very much a question of the investment of resources in nurturing that talent and ability because of parents' resources or because the national school system has given everyone a fair shot at surfacing and nurturing that talent. I have not signed up my children for tuition because I want them to have uh, a childhood. 
Um, you know, I want them to learn through play and to discover their own passion and interest. And if you're in enrichment classes back to back, then you're not allowed to explore, to discover your own interests. So for me, I'm a tiger parent, but my passion or my interests are not towards his grades, it's towards his passion and his, in his interests. Meritocracy allows those who have the means to game the system. But what happens to the children whose parents don't have the means? Mm, they get left behind. To me, it is not a problem if the parents are able to transfer their privilege down to their children. It is how then the children use this privilege. It can go in that direction where it will breed elitism, or it can go to another direction where this privilege can be shared with those who are less well-to-do. There's a great deal of tension between satisfying individual parents' preferences and promoting the greater common good. When we look back at the education system, one thing that's particularly challenging is that some of the best schools or the elite schools are those that are steeped in Chinese culture. I actually went to a primary school that is founded like that. My primary school, Nan Chao Fu Xiao, was one of four primary schools that was founded and run by the Hokkien Hui Guan, actually. The Special Assistance Plan schools, or what we normally call the SAP schools, to even enrol in a SAP school, you must take Chinese as a mother tongue language. So that is already a very strict criterion. I think our political leader at that time had the foresight to see China as a superpower in the makings. And if we do not have enough people, enough people in the workforce who are conversant and strong in Mandarin, then we would uh, be a disadvantage when China comes up. That's why they introduced the SAP scheme in 1978 and it came to effect in 1979. I remember that when I was in primary school, I had Indian and Malay classmates actually. They came from families where they thought that they are already really good in the languages and they want their sons and daughters to actually receive a Chinese education. There are Indian students, there are Malay students who take Mandarin as a mother tongue language. I mean, yeah, fine. But how many actually do that? It's a very small group. It becomes very racially homogenous. Very, very few who are non-Chinese who are in the school. Then what happens to the issue of diversity? I have friends who are from SAP schools. And when we go to school together in uni or in JC, they are not aware of certain things about their Malay friend or their Indian friend. And that to me was a culture shock because how could you not know that Muslims need to eat halal food? That level of lack of understanding is quite mind-boggling for a Singaporean. We're not saying that the SAP schools should cease to exist. But what we do want to call out for is that for the schools to be a lot more inclusive. Inclusive in the sense that it can allow students who do not take Chinese as a mother tongue language to enroll in the school. There's all these sort of little nuances to our meritocratic system which should be reviewed from time to time and see whether there are ways in which to make them more inclusive. The day may really come where we no longer draw those lines, where we say that we are just one Singapore, there is no longer Singapore Chinese community or Singapore Malay community. Do I foresee this day coming anytime soon? The answer is no. Right? But in the meantime, since it's not here yet, I think it's very important for each of the communities to make sure that its own members are cognizant of what goes on in the whole of Singapore and in the other communities. Another way in which segregation has come about, perhaps because of the way we practice meritocracy and you go to better universities and you are part of the so-called cognitive elites of Singapore globally and you access better jobs. The admissions office at Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, MIT, a small handful of other schools in the United States, effectively decides who gets ahead in America. At Oxford and Cambridge and the Russell Group universities in the UK, the same thing is true. In Singapore, the question of who gets into elite universities determines a great deal about the structure of the Singaporean elite and Singaporean society. An inter-university survey released in June found Singapore undergraduates feel there is a deep-seated and unhealthy obsession with grades. And that they have to perform well to get their foot through the door in job applications. I think it stems from a lot of us students and a lot of us Singaporean students being indoctrinated from young on how getting good grades 
is your ticket to success. I'm a design tutor at the National University of Singapore. Whenever we give them a set of requirements, they'll ask, all the questions are leading up to how can I get an E from it somehow? When I was teaching in NUS, in Singapore, the first question is, how many words? Teacher, how many words do you want me to write? 800 words, 900 words, rather than like actually grappling with first principles and getting creative. I'm beginning to see more and more students coming into university, being a little, just a little bit more obsessed about their grades compared to say five or 10 years ago. I think attending these elite schools and reputable universities, we would naturally just compare ourselves to one another. I do feel that it adds a lot of stress and anxiety to someone's uh, mental wellness. Psychologists, for example, have surveyed and found that there are elite schools in which over half of the class has clinical symptoms of anxiety or depression. As a mental professional, it's quite heartbreaking seeing of young people facing such immense pressure. I run a social service agency that serves young people who are struggling with mental health conditions called Campus Sci. Uh, in short, it's called Campus Peer Support for Youth. Some of the top concerns is, of course, I think, academic stress. It might cause severe anxiety. If it's causing dysfunction in their daily lives, then they would have to seek professional help. Yesterday's session was about how do you recognise signs, symptoms of someone who is troubled and maybe thinking about suicide. That's a very difficult topic. We will be actually training and equipping these secondary school students in Pongo with basic mental literacy and peer support skills so that they can better support their peers who are in distress. Sometimes when I have anonymous confessions on my Instagram page, I get your next secondary school kid telling me that they're very stressed in school, they're not performing well, they feel like they let down their parents. I relate to that a lot and I just tell them how I feel and that your grades are not the be-all and all here in Singapore. And I hope one day when I say this phrase, nobody will scoff at me saying this. Our grades are very important, of course, but not more important than their mental health. Meritocratic competition doesn't end with school. It continues into the workforce. So meritocratic workers, even those inside the elite, are under a constant pressure to continue to succeed, to continue to outcompete others. The way my generation of students look to beef out their resumes is mostly going to be very experience and qualifications based. During the summer break, they will find an internship. During the winter break, they'll try to find an internship. These qualifications and internships would serve as evidence of their so-called ability. Well, we see that parents mobilize their social networks to help their kids secure meaningful, valuable internships. Now, let's just think then about students in our universities in Singapore who are going to be the first-time graduates in their families. They're not going to have similar opportunities as the students who have parents in the professional class and sort of management level of industry and know their peers in industry. So can we actually think about how Meritocracy needs to be complemented by other methods and programs so that um, these kids gather the right work experience, gather the useful context so that when they finally graduate, they have as much chance. This is important for our society uh, because we need to know we will have different starting points uh, from one another. I need to know that I still have the chance an opportunity despite my starting point. I'm currently mentoring an IT graduate. We are working together on the operation work and managing areas, different offices that we have. And uh, put it accordingly. So maybe we can say this is not the right... It's very easy to connect with Anders because we go through the same thing you know, in IT a few months ago when I really wanted to give up on this program. I felt very stressed. So uh, I told Anders that I want to give up. His response to me was, why are you giving up on yourself when I haven't given up on you? Which makes me feel that he cares and valued me as an uh, intern. Mentorship has come up as a very important 
support for students at, across many levels. We asked students basically if if they had a non-parent mentor who guided them in their career choices about life problems. And we found that students who had better clarity had worked with a mentor. People do need a helping hand, what we would call compassionate meritocracy, rather than, well, you're down, you're out, you're out for good. We have to remember that meritocracy is fundamentally a very individualistic model of achievement. And there's also this tendency within a meritocracy to believe that your success is entirely your own doing. So elites are sort of trained to be proud of themselves for winning in a genuine competition, which is not a fair competition. And they're proud on account of the genuineness, but insufficiently aware of the unfairness. We need to show empathy and compassion towards others because not everyone will have the kinds of opportunities or privileges that some of us have. I think our meritocracy served well for that period that we were developing and needed to get to a certain point, being a newly independent country. But moving on from that, we do have to relook what this meritocracy teaches our citizens and what kind of values it inculcates. There's every threat that the concept of meritocracy will cause those who progress to be puffed up and to say we deserve our position and why can't everybody else put in the same effort as I did to arrive where I am. But our concept of meritocracy in Singapore has to be different from that. We're actually too small to afford this kind of division and this kind of arrogance and from a bottom up, any kind of envy. The smaller we are, the more we should realise we need one another so much more. <laughs>